Hi, Shmuel. Hi, Tom. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So today I'm with Shmuel Barr. We've uh, been friends for 17 years. A few weeks before we first met in uh, 2003, Shmuel retired from 30 years service in the Israeli government, first in IDF intelligence and then in various analytical and operational positions in another branch of Israel's government. We won't speak about those matters here because they're confidential. I, I know from my many discussions with Shmuel though, since we met, that he has an incredibly wide, wide range of knowledge and a great strategic overview about many matters. Um, Shmuel, before we get to that though, since I've asked the other people I'm, I'm having conversations with, just tell us very briefly about your family background and your childhood. Well, very simple. I was brought up in the West Indies, in Jamaica, and my parents, my family got there from uh, you would call it a world tour from Jerusalem originally, when my grandfather left Jerusalem after World War, uh, during World War I, uh, to Manchester, where he got involved in the textile industry and then to Jamaica. Uh, and then I lived in different countries, uh, come from a typical Jewish polyglot uh, uh, family, speaking at home uh, English, Jamaican, Arabic, French, Ladino, uh, Hebrew, etc. In fact, sure, I'm not going to let this pass without you just saying one or two sentences with your Jamaican accent, which I love. Just say how. <laughs> no, man, if I speak like a Jamaican, you won't understand me anyway. <laughs> very good. Uh, I am very impressed with what we won't ask you to speak Ladino and Arabic with your Jamaican accent. Uh, anyway. No. Uh, Okay, so Shmuel, I, I know that in the, the mid-1980s, during your government years, you developed a kind of world-class expertise on the ideology and, and operational codes of Islamic fundamentalist movements um, and in the jihadi movement before it uh, later became Al-Qaeda. And we're gonna get to that in a minute. But I'd just like to ask you very quickly about the state of the world today, and in particular, what's going on in America. So as we all know, statues honoring Christopher Columbus himself have been torn down all over America. In some cases, they've even been taken down uh, by the city authorities. In other cases, like Miami, uh, red uh, communist hammer and sickles were painted on the Columbus statue. Uh, Abraham Lincoln statues have been taken down, even though he emancipated the slaves. Their calls to abolish American Independence Day. And in fact, a few days ago, an Iranian Ayatollah said, we have been chanting death to America for 40 years, but now the Americans are doing it to themselves. So Shmuel, what is going on with America and what repercussions does this have for the rest of us? Well, I'm actually speaking with a lot of my American friends and none of them actually understand what's going on in America. So, uh, but sometimes when you look at things from a historic perspective, you can understand things a bit uh, more. Uh, the United States has lost its social cohesion or its identity cohesion for quite some time. Uh, the concept of the United States was that America is a melting pot and you can maintain your cultural heritage, etc., but you have to give preference or priority to your American identity. The moment they moved into a sort of multiculturalism, pluralism, then they lost both worlds. In other words, they weren't a really uh, multicultural uh, uh, a country like Belgium, where you have Flemish and you have Wallon and they weren't a melting pot at all. And this is a danger when you uh, are actually sitting on the, on the fence. Uh, the other thing is iconoclasm in general, uh, which uh, what's happening there is that it's almost Orwellian. It goes to show that uh, Orwell came out against the fascism and the rewriting of history and historic revisionism and uh, historic revisionism on a on a day-to-day -day basis uh, you know when uh, Winston uh, it deletes one country and adds another country etc from the records and this is basically what's happening in America it's the same concept we delete from our history now uh, uh, 
it's well known that a nation which forgets its history uh, is doomed to repeat it. Uh, now, we cannot, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, to try to impose on people of 200, 300, 400 years ago the um, morals and the values that we hold today is ridiculous because then we would have to take down all of the statutes which adorn all of the cities in Europe because none of them meet our standards. We would have to blow up the pyramids because they were built with slave labor, by the way, African slave labor to a great extent, as we can see in the pictures. Uh, uh, we would have to exhume all of the popes in the Vatican and, of course, in Westminster, etc., because none of these people uh, meet our standards. So basically, we would have to destroy Western civilization as it is. Uh, and I think that people don't understand that uh, there has to be some continuity to a uh, to culture. Uh, it's strange. Uh, what's more strange than the more radical uh, elements in American society who are doing this is the, you know, like Eugene Unesco's um, uh, rhinoceros, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, people on what you would call the establishment left wing in the United States who are condoning it. He was saying, yes, we have to rethink the role of Columbus, we have to rethink the role of Ulysses Grant. Uh, we found some obscure mention that, uh, I mean, uh, to blow up the Rushmore Mountain, <laughs> things like that. In other words, uh, I think that uh, the weakening of the, um, of the mainstream in the face of such things is, I think, the most uh, worrying aspect. It's, it's not only uh, Democrats. Yesterday, two Republican senators said that Columbus Day should no longer be a national holiday and it should be replaced with uh, this Juneteenth Day. And apparently, uh, Barack Obama never mentioned or tweeted about Juneteenth in his eight years. So it's, it's maybe a crisis of confidence across the American establishment. Um, Shmuel, when we've spoken before, you also mentioned that even before the present episode, um, that uh, America was in the 21st century and, and Russia, for example, was in the 19th century, and you mentioned stuff about John Kerry and so on. Why don't you also explain how yeah. different countries were in different you know, thought processes? Well, uh, I, I think that, I mean, this has to do with the whole concept of international relations. Uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, John Kerry said, uh, but you can't do that. You just can't walk into a country and take it over. This isn't the 19th century. And the Russians actually retorted, excuse me, why not what's changed? Uh, which, from the point of view, we are living in uh, some sort of time war where some nations believe that we have entered some sort of pristine uh, and new and moral 21st century, and the others do not see why the change of the century warrants a change in the concept of international relations and force politics. Uh, and this clash is a, a it's like uh, trying to wage a land war with naval vessels. And a, in other words, you have to have uh, some sort of common denominator in order to, to manage international relations. Now, you can recognize that you want to be in the 21st century as you see it, but others are not. And this is also the problem of the West in dealing with Islamic terrorism. Uh, many years ago, I, after the fall of the Soviet Union, I was briefing senior people in Prague, to the very intelligence community, and I was explaining... Sorry? In Prague, in, Czech, in the Czech, there was Czech, still Czechoslovakia. And they were all very young because they'd kicked out all of the communists. And then I was explaining Islamic uh, ideology. And the person at the head of this uh, organization says to me, uh, Shmuel, you can't really mean that they believe in all of that. So I said, why not? Well, he says, you see, look at this room here. A year ago, everybody here was a communist, but now we know that there were no communists and everybody was pretending to be a communist because everybody thought that everybody else was a communist. So basically, people who come from uh, quintessentially uh, rationalist cultures, like the Czechs and the Dutch are like that, you know, um, 
cannot understand why anybody would act not on ration, on what they perceive as rationality. Uh, and this has to do with the whole issue of you deal with uh, conflicts which are religious in nature. You say, well, we don't do religion. We don't do religion. Yes, but they do religion. And so uh, you have to wage relations and wars with the common denominator of the, two, of the weapons of that war. I, I think that, uh, you know, they think it's very passe. And, and also maybe in Europe, we, are not, we don't study enough about medieval times to understand that, of course, a few centuries ago, there were, people did wage a kind of crusades and jihadism and so on, as many do in the Middle East and Muslim world today. So what, what, I mean, you are an expert on jihadi movements, or you were in the past. You know, they've been defeated, so to speak, in Raqqa, ISIS's capital. Uh, but America's withdrawing from, uh, from Afghanistan, and it's much weakened. America's turning in on itself. European, European nations are kind of uh, not very um, proactive. Well, I, I wouldn't, I, by the way, I wouldn't call this they are defeated, uh, because you do not, with military power, you do not defeat an ideology. Yeah, the ideology is still in itself. I meant they're, they're based yeah, on, yeah. but they're not defeated, absolutely. So, so how strong are they, in fact, today? Uh, I, I, I think that the, uh, the underlying motivation which draws people into this ideology remains, and it will get stronger. I believe that the next wave that we're going to see is going to be among uh, refugees who came to Europe after terrible horrors in their home countries. They are not, will not be integrated into Europe because Europe is going through an identity crisis anyway, and certainly economic crises. When the 10 year old boy who reaches Europe uh, grows up to the age of 20 and he's approached by a jihadi recruiter who will say, you remember the stories about uh, your uncle and your aunt and your father were murdered by the Syrian regime and the Russians and the Iranians. Well, it's maybe it's hard to go there to fight, but here yeah, you can fight their, uh, uh, their collaborators, the Europeans who are now embracing Assad and re-legitimizing him, etc. So uh, I believe that we, uh, we will have this next uh, wave of jihadism. And uh, of course, uh, the whole Middle East is, uh, has disintegrated. And I think that it's our... our quite a misperception to say that Assad won the war. Assad uh, didn't win the war. Russia and Iran won a military victory. In uh, Assad, yeah, in Syria. Assad controls about 60% of Syria, and it's always 60%. In other words, if he moves forces, his own and the Iranians, uh, from one place to the other, then he loses control of the place that he's moved his forces from. We can see this today in the Sueda and Dara and other places. Uh, the economic situation is terrible, the humanitarian situation is terrible, uh, and the, uh, the meaning of this is that he hasn't won the war, that the um, Syria, like Iraq, like Yemen, like Libya, are what I call the Humpty Dumpty states. In other words, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, he took a big fall, and uh, none of the, the kids, well, we did. All the king's men couldn't put Humpty together. Yes, yeah, so in this case, it's not all the king's men, it's all the czar's men, which is the czar Putin. Well, uh, and uh, <laughs> Kenya for another 30 years or something in this election. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, uh, in other words, this is what I call political entropy. The third law of thermodynamics states that the energy which is expended from a system and moving from order to chaos is not enough energy to bring it back into order and in uh, in uh, non-professional words it means that you can make a, an omelet out of an egg but it's far more difficult it takes more energy to make an egg out of an omelet to reconstruct the egg so this is therefore that since there is no external energy in the world available to go and impose order in syria or libya or yemen or iraq then the process of this political entropy is going to continue. Uh, as it continues, then it means that people are going to be pushed out of their countries, add to that the climate issues, add to that the economic issues, add to that the coronavirus, 
then we are just waiting. It's like a chronicle of a death foretold. We're waiting for the next explosion. Which, which, um, where, which particular countries in the Middle East are ones to watch? I mean, you know, people, you know, countries like Libya, uh, the West help overthrow Gaddafi and then they kind of absent him themselves and there's a tremendous civil war going on there and it's bet people most people haven't got a clue the media barely cover it they can be also wave of you know can destabilize Algeria right further and so on what, I mean what's which countries are the ones to watch also from a western point of view beyond Syria that we know about oh. Look, it depends on which Europe you are, because Europe is also falling apart. I mean, Brexit is one thing, but definitely the interests of Sweden or of, uh, not Scandinavian, but of Germany mm. and Greece and Greece and Italy are not the same interests, because some countries are more susceptible to the uh, consequences and spillover of migration than others. Um, and therefore, uh, Algeria, uh, in Algeria, you have a protest which has been dampened by the coronavirus, but actually at some point or another, as the economic situation in the world uh, uh, deteriorates, as the economic situation in Algeria, which is based on uh, gas and oil, deteriorates, then you will have people go out on the streets again. They, as opposed, opposed to the Syrians who didn't have a call it a cultural hinterland in Europe, uh, the Algerians do, and you see that the Algerians in France and in Belgium are very much involved in the social media, which in my company, by the way, do the monitoring of the social media, so it's fascinating to see what's happening there. Uh, in, uh, and therefore, we will see, as things get worse in Algeria, people saying, come over, okay? Um, so that's one thing quicker, isn't it? The land, for people who don't know, maybe in America, the distance that people are sailing, refugees or migrants, from Libya to Sicily and Italy is much larger bit of sea than coming from Morocco, Algeria. It's much easier to get if they start. Uh, exactly. Uh, it's, it's a pond. It's a pond. But I think that every single aspect, Libya is another story. And not only because Libya is a portal to Europe from Africa, but also because of the Turkish uh, GNA uh, uh, Libyan regime, uh, which is a Muslim Brotherhood regime relationship. Just in case people don't know, because it's hardly reported in the general media, right now in Libya, Erdogan, the president or dictator of Turkey, has sent a lot of troops there, and Putin also sent some unofficial troops to Libya. What, that, why, what is this contest between Turkey and, uh, uh, and, and Russia? I think it would, be, it would be very difficult in this context, to, in this short space, to explain the intricacies of the politics of what's going on in Libya. I think it would suffice to say that uh, Erdogan, uh, the president of Turkey, is interested in expanding his influence through uh, Turkish Cyprus and into the Mediterranean and to have a chokehold on the uh, gas production and gas uh, supply uh, of Israel, Cyprus and Greece. And therefore, we can expect that a concatenation of interest, the Turkish interest with the Libyan on one hand, uh, the Russian interest to play a role in the Mediterranean, Lebanese, or the other words, Hezbollah and Iranian interest to somehow or other disrupt Israeli economic plans in the Mediterranean, that all of this is a powder keg which could easily explode. Okay. So, but, so that's another reason to, you look at Libya from different strategic reasons than you look, let's say, at what's happening in Algeria or Morocco. So it's different. And then, yeah. So just uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, just for people that don't know, today Israel, um, Greece, and Cyprus have a kind of alliance that they didn't used to have in the past. That's also partly based on these gas, these underwater gas um, discoveries. But um, I believe that in Italy, in particular, a very high proportion of Italian natural gas comes from Libya. And that's why also the Russians also building some kind of um, base, military base in Libya. They can top off gas supply, countries like Italy. Right. Right? 
Well, not? a lot of this has to do also with the uh, energy crisis, even before the coronavirus, uh, which of course uh, reduced demand for energy. Um, uh, Russia, for very simplistic commercial reasons, and actually with very little uh, energy market expertise, uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Rosneft decided to try to break the American uh, shale oil and the Saudi uh, uh, control of the oil market. What he didn't realize is that the Saudis and the Americans are far more proficient in the oil market than he is. Um, and uh, uh, since he is uh, the entire Russian oil industry uh, lives off the state. In other words, they don't really have to be uh, you know, um, uh, productive or, or, or profitable. So what happened was that uh, the Russians, who do not have the ability to maintain low oil prices for an extended period of time because they don't have the reserves, and the delta between their um, the oil prices and their budget, the oil, uh, the prices in the budget is much, much higher than others. And secondly, that Russian oil, if you turn that off what Russian oil production sites, it is almost impossible within a short period of time to turn them on again, as opposed to the American sites and the uh, Saudi sites, which are used uh, much more sophisticated than modern technology. Mm -hmm. The meaning of this, yeah, the, so the meaning of this is that uh, the, that Russia becomes more and more desperate and is looking for ways to impose a, some sort of new order, which will help in its, in its economic crisis. Um, just, uh, let's just speak briefly then about um, Iran. Um, the middle, both Iran and also the, the increasing alliance between Israel and most of the Sunni Arab world. Although with some of it still beneath the radar, it's increasingly above the surface too, uh, more open. What do you think will have a continuation of that? Has Iran overstretched itself? For people that don't know, because it's really not covered properly, Iran put a lot of ground troops, both themselves and through Shia militias they formed in Syria. The Iranians want to build a port, I believe, in Syria. Are the Iranians overstretched in, in Iraq, in Syria, in uh, Yemen and so on, in Gaza? or um, what, what, what do you think of that? Look, uh, you should not judge an ideological regime uh, like Iran, like you would judge a Western uh, government which says, I'm overstretched, I'm going to have to reduce my footprint here and there because I have to prioritize, etc. Uh, many years ago, I think it was Lafzanjani who said that if Iran gives up the export of the revolution, it's no longer the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, obviously, we're not talking about the Iranian people. The Iranian people, uh, I think, uh, definitely, uh, it's rather fascinating. They say that probably the most pro-American uh, populace in the Middle East after Israel is, is the Iranians in terms of admiration of American uh, culture. No question. Yeah. Right. Um, however, we have a regime which is, for them, it's a matter of survival. We have the IRGC, which I think is the, let's say, second generation, uh, call it the Jacobian stage of the, uh, of the revolution. In other words, every revolution has a stage of the revolution where you say, we do this and everything will be okay. Then some, not everything is okay. Well, there are two ways of looking at it. Maybe we've got to tweak the revolution and reform it, okay? And there's another way, which is said, no, we weren't just, we weren't uh, loyal enough to the revolution. We didn't take the revolution all the way. So uh, within the IRGC, you have, and the, and the besiege, you have that uh, concept. We have to remember that Iran is not a clerical regime. It is a Praetorian state managed by the IRGC, who are the gatekeepers of the Supreme Leader. Now, the Supreme Leader is ill. So I just want to say, in case anyone doesn't know, the IRGC is the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Revolutionary Guard, yeah. 
people formed after the 79 revolution, so 41 years ago, but they're very much still in, uh, in command. Uh, they are in command, even more so in command than they were in the past. Now, uh, all of the gators of Khomeini are from the IRGC. Now, what that means is when, when he dies, he will eventually, he's ill, he has cancer, he will die, and the chances of the IRGC allowing the appointment of another second-rate cleric, because there are no top clerics who are uh, candidates, are uh, they will remember that they appointed Khomeini and it backfired because at one point when you appoint somebody to be supreme leader, he gets up in the morning and he says, oh my, you know, actually I like being supreme leader and I'm going to take decisions and that's not what they want. The Iranian constitution allows them to actually maintain a sort of uh, uh, leadership council for an indefinite period of time. Now, what that means is that we would have Iran moving into a stage which is less Islamic oriented in that concept, but more Iranian nationalist oriented, where uh, the IRGC is much more Iranian nationalist, believes that as opposed to the old guard who are, were careful of, of uh, projecting Iranian racial superiority over the Arabs, the IRGC has no qualms about it. And so uh, we may see a renewal of the revolutionary zeal uh, with all sorts of Iranian nationalist overtones towards countries like Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, which they consider part of Iran anyway, and uh, so on and so forth. So now, this here we enter the nuclear issue. Um, Iran can theoretically have enough fissile material uh, by the end of a year uh, to form one nuclear weapon. The thing is that one nuclear weapon doesn't make you a nuclear power. The question is, do you demonstrate your capability without exploding something or having really credible information in the world that you've got a lot of weapons? So then it doesn't really matter. So if you explode, if you have enough only for one weapon and you explode it, then you don't have any more, right? right? If you wait, then you don't have deterrence. Now, in order to have deterrence, you have to have what is called in the jargon, second strike capability. In other words, to be able to say, I have the missiles and the weapons enough that even if you attack me, I can destroy you, okay? This is what created uh, third world, uh, the Cold War deterrence uh, balance of uh, MAD, uh, mutually assured destruction. This will never exist in the, in the Middle East. As Iran gets closer to nuclear capability, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, uh, other countries are going to say, uh, Egypt, uh, the, uh, yeah, the question is going to arise how Israel will manage its own uh, nuclear policy. And then when you have a polynuclear Middle East, it's not going to be like the Cold War. In other words, uh, first of all, the regimes aren't as rational in our terms as they, they integrate religious dictates and things which didn't exist between the United States and Russia. They integrate all sorts of, um, of uh, popular perceptions, which uh, nuclear policy and strategy in the Cold War was purely in the hands of the leadership and very, very controlled. And none of these countries except Israel have a high level intelligence which will allow you to prevent yourself from making mistakes. In other words, um, uh, when the Cold War developed, then both the United States and Russia had satellites, they knew exactly what was going on. So a human intelligence source, a human source could say, this is happening, they can look at the pictures. This doesn't exist in the Middle East. So when you put all of that together, you have high potential for uh, nuclear accidents, for the nuclear conflict, uh, because of mistaken perceptions. There's that also, is the real uh, threat of uh, the nuclear Middle East. There's also what they, they call a Mexican standoff, where 
everyone's pointing a gun at each other. And it's not like you said, the Soviets and Americans, it's a very unstable situation with, with multiple countries having nuclear devices. Do you, are you confident yeah. that um, Iran will be stopped from going nuclear? I mean, you know, Trump. Uh, no, Trump is no, quite, because but, but no one's really helping the Trump administration's tough line to try and stop the Iranians uh, progressing on their nuclear quest. I, I, I think I don't think that it will be stopped. I think that um, as things now seem, uh, the coronavirus has uh, put paid to Trump's uh, second term, uh, second term in office. Um, I think that the radical sentiment in the United States uh, has actually, to a great extent, have pulled the Democratic Party uh, more radical and therefore uh, more tolerant of uh, Iranian, uh, more or less along the Obama lines. Obama had great admiration for Iran. Uh, he quite despised these uh, desert Arabs who, you know, old-fashioned colonial style um, uh, and so I think that this is still the bon ton in the Democratic Party. Uh, therefore, uh, the United States will change its policy. The Europeans um, are also, uh, they are looking only at the very short term. A, um, a foreign, foreign minister of a large European uh, country who I had uh, dinner with once said to me, uh, you know, Shmuel, this is the problem. Once there were Americans, we Europeans were willing to uh, play around with dictators, etc., to give in because we always knew that the American cavalry was on the was around the corner and they would come and save us. But now the Europeans remain Europeans. The Americans are behaving like Europeans, and there's nobody left in the world to be Americans. And I think that this encapsulates. Maybe Israel and one or two allies like India and so on. Someone has to do it. I, I, no, I, I again, uh, again, Israel is operating on a day-to-day -day basis of uh, personal interests of uh, leaderships. Uh, there is no strategy when you don't have a a, a solid and um, and stable uh, long-term government. You cannot have strategy. Uh, strategy in today's world, I, I, uh, I do projects on the next five years in the Middle East, next 10 years in the Middle East for the American Department of Defense. And I met with somebody in the British government and I said, how do you do long term planning? And he says, well, what's long term? I said, five years? He says, no, no, here it's six months. So, <laughs> uh, so, so. There's a famous uh, saying when, uh, I can't remember, remember if it was Chairman Mao or another Chinese communist leader, and it was the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. Oh, yes. He was asked, do you think the French Revolution was a success? And he said, it's too early to tell. Yeah, exactly. And yes, I think it was de Gaulle who asked Mao, uh, what do you think of the historic implications of the French Revolution? He said, it's too early to tell. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Um, they, because especially younger people are living in this instant world of Instagram and TikTok and all this stuff, they haven't got to, and also they thankfully, pe most people, at least in Western Europe and America, haven't known fascism or, or war, not on the homeland, for decades, for 70 years in Europe, 75 years. I just hope that they don't realize it's a mean world out there. And the Iranian but the, this is the clash. This is the clash between a world which lives in its history as if it were today and not in historic perspective, and a world which doesn't even remember its history. Right. right. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I think that this is a clash. And I also think uh, uh, America is the extreme case of people not knowing history at all. Uh, because they're not teaching it anymore, they don't respect it anymore. But um, when you see, for example, that you can tell somebody that Thomas Jefferson was a racist and so you have to take down his statues, uh, then uh, nobody's interested in really understanding and reading all of Thomas Jefferson's works and his letters and, you know, uh, as president and as, uh, as uh, representative to France, etc. No. 
somebody said something. Uh, you can't explain to people who decide that Columbus was a racist colonialist, whatever, that Columbus actually didn't colonize anything. He was an explorer. He came, he met, he left. Uh, or, or they would cherry pick in Britain, you know, as you know, there also was written church was a racist on the right in central London, they had to protect the cenotaph. And what they'll do is they'll cherry pick a single sentence from uh, somebody's 80 years life, and then they will twist it or they, anyway, the West is not perfect, democracy is not perfect, but I, I fear that too many people don't quite understand that you know, there are people out there, whether in Iran or Russia or China or ISIS, that are not so well intended and they, they have patience and they are playing the long game and the West needs to know. Uh, how to uh, uh, I, I, think, I think that um, if we're looking at the Middle East in the next uh, decades, um, you're looking at an area which is, got, which is imploding and disintegrating. Um, uh, when this happens, then the price of hostility towards external forces becomes less. When you are a country with a lot of interest and you're a leader of a country and you know that the country is large and has multiple international interests, you are far more careful in provoking conflict with external forces. But when you are only part of a country, your country is weak and is imploded, then uh, the price of anything you do is much less. Uh, ISIS could act with impunity against Westerners because ISIS wasn't a country which had to trade with the West or send or have uh, air traffic with the West or something like that. Okay, so the imploding and the atomization, this is true also about the Israeli-Palestinian issue that as the Palestinians after Abu Mazen and Mahmoud Abbas uh, dies, there's a very little chance that Palestinian authority will remain a unified authority. And we're going to have something along the lines of the Chinese warlord period, which means in all of the region, which means that Israel's ability to deter depends on there being a unified command, one leader, one elite, where you can send your deterrent message to that leader he is going to be able to interpret it, to realize what the price of uh, conflict is, and, to, and he also has to have control over his forces in order to preclude conflict. We won't have all of that. So, Shmuel, just uh, we're almost out of time. Just to finish off on that note, as we know, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is old, he's unwell, he's got various illnesses. There, which of the various Palestinian warlords and politicians who are putting themselves in position to try and take over, which, which one or which two or three do you think might be Abbas's successor? None. None. Uh, I, I think, no, I, I think that, again, there is a tendency in Western thought to say, X goes, Y comes in. Something has to be replaced. Uh, um, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. We forget that nature didn't abhor a vacuum in China for decades, in Japan for decades, in the Middle East in the period of uh, the end of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and so on and so forth. In other words, uh, the uh, case of, of failed uh, regimes, which, or, or by the way, in medieval Europe, Right. In other words, the large parts of medieval Europe, which were not uh, organized or ordered. So the idea that you always have to have a successor, that it's linear, is absolutely incorrect, both historically and logically. Yes, I mean, people forget that in Europe, most nation states are really quite recent, uh, last, you know, a couple of hundred years. Just very finally, could Hamas, which are maybe, maybe do have a better uniformed command structure and leadership? Obviously, they... they uh, no, but even Hamas, Hamas doesn't have, for example, a spiritual leadership. It uh, actually gets its spiritual leadership, some of them from Iran and uh, by proxy, the, the Sunnis, and some of them from the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, the, uh, the entire structure of Hamas basically is uh, certain elements who get their money 
their weapons and their orders from external forces. In other words, uh, in the Palestinian politics, there's always been the, the conflict between what they call the Dachel and the Kharij, the inside and the outside, uh, where the outside, it's fascinating because it's a national movement, unlike any other national movement, which had a, an exile leadership, where the exile leadership, so to speak, has always been stronger than the local leadership. This didn't happen in the Zionist movement, it didn't happen in the Algerian movement. So, um, uh, so I don't see a sort of normalization of Hamas leadership, so they'll say, okay, these are the prices, this is what we do, etc., completely disconnected from their external patrons. We're, we're talking about patron-proxy surrogate relationships. We're, we're, will uh, maybe other countries like Iran and Turkey, or maybe the Saudis, sponsor these different contenders for power in the West Bank and arm them and so on? Is that likely to happen? They'll, they'll find uh, they each have their own militia or control? Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, in terms of Turkey and Iran and others uh, funding them, uh, you know, they said to Sachin Sarvest Le Mem shows it's going to be the same. Uh, but I, I, I think that um, the, uh, the, main, uh, the main issue on the table today is not uh, you know, our tunnel village and uh, Hamas or the Palestinian Authority or something like that. At the very worst, Israel can actually block itself off uh, if ideologically and politically, domestically, Israel can do that, which is another question. But... Uh, I, yeah. I, I mean, uh, look, if you have absolutely no contact with the Palestinians, I'm talking about a case where not Paris's dream of an integrated whatever and not uh, uh, the far right dream of uh, all of us together, you know, in uh, west of the Jordan River, but uh, basically a real, real um, uh, disconnect. Uh, disengagement from the Palestinians, where they say, you know something, we don't want to be connected with you, not with electricity, and not with uh, our workers, and not with nothing, nothing. And then, uh, basically, we would have some sort of way to control it if they, as, they, uh, as they disintegrate. Uh, but Israeli politics doesn't allow that for various reasons. So we are actually constrained to remain linked to an entity which is falling apart and uh, uh, which we won't be able to contain. Um, uh, this is, I mean, this is one of the tragedies of the situation. Um, but, I, uh, but I think that the, the main picture of the Middle East, the disintegration, the atomization, the entropy, uh, the, uh, the, the implications of, uh, uh, of large uh, powers, one, the United States, which has abdicated its role as a great power, two others which have their own concepts of uh, the China and, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and Russia, who have their own concepts of their own role as great powers. This is what's going to impact our lives. Uh, and as these countries get more desperate economically, then the willingness for adventurism and for um, uh, using force and uh, for aggressive aggression in international relationships is going to grow. Um, I, I work with uh, now with uh, um, uh, with uh, European and American. Um, uh, agencies, uh, security agencies, etc. with my company where we do analysis of things. You look at what's happening in Europe on the, on the grounds of how do people, uh, let's say, um, uh, second and third generation Algerians and Moroccans in Holland and Belgium and France and uh, how do they express themselves? They are not living in Paris or Marseille or uh, Amsterdam, they are, they are, even though they've never been there, living in their home countries. This is what happened, for example, in the 7-7 attacks. Pakistanis born in the UK, 
but who are living spiritually in Karachi. And in the global information era where people are being fed all the time by these messages, they can actually disengage from the countries they live in and it makes it easier for them to do terrorist attacks and damage to people who otherwise they would say, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to mess the, you know, the place where I live in. And this is a danger, this is going to exacerbate. So Shmuel, unfortunately we're, we're out of time. That's been very fascinating. Um, a little bit pessimistic or more than a little bit, uh, about the middle no, that was my that was my optimistic oh. that was my optimist okay, let me tell you something really let me tell you uh, yeah let me tell you just a short oh, story right. an old friend okay, yeah. yeah an old friend of ours who had lived through world war ii had fought in the war of independence fought in the 56 etc etc said to us once in the height of the intifada i don't understand you young people so impatient when i was young hitler had occupied all of europe uh, Rommel was beating Montgomery in the Western Desert. We were preparing for a last stand on the Carmel Mountain. Ever since then, uh, the, the Americans and the Russians were going to blow up the world in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Ever since then, things have just been looking up. So you have to have generational perspective. You do. I'm not saying it's the most pessimistic scenario, but I do worry that people may not realize, at least in the West, that we have been fortunate enough to live through some very good decades and a mixture of pandemics, the coronavirus and political instability in America, no longer assuming that police will policeman role means we may be re-entering a more dangerous phase of history. That's what I think. We, we, should, have taken, we should have taken Joseph's advice to Pharaoh. When you go through good years, you've got to start uh, getting ready for the bad years. Right. Instead of that, we wasted the fruits of the good years. That's right. So thank you very much, Noel. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.